Hello and welcome. My name's Tom Ward and I'm the newest member of Virtual Futures, an entity with 22 years of history, much of which is represented in the audience tonight. <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to thank the library for having us. It's the first time we've been here and it's a gorgeous little venue. We'd also like to shout out to John Merrick at Verso Books for helping us put this event together. And of course, to Mackenzie Walk, who's taken time out of his busy book schedule to join us. So, for those of you here for the first time, the original Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-1990s. I was about five months old at the time. Mm -hmm. To quote its co-founder, it occurred at the tipping point of the technologization of first world cultures. Whilst they were most often portrayed as techno-positivist festivals of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as the Guardian put it, their actual aim, hidden behind the brush, steel and silicon, the jargon, the charismatic prophets and the techno-parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. What they did is cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. In short, this Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Mackenzie Walk is a familiar face to the Virtual Futures veterans, having made an appearance at the conference in 1995. In the 22 years since he composed his piece, Virtual Geography, Living with the Global Media Events, he has written books that include The Hacker Manifesto in 2004, which explored the hacker class who create new things and free information from their material constraints, the spectacle of disintegration in 2013 that sought to update renegade philosopher Guy Debord's theories into the 21st century, and Molecular Red in 2015, which analyzed the relationship between us and our planetary resources now that the waste products do not return to nature so the cycle can renew itself. In his latest work, General Intellects, he turns his attention to the problem of an intellectual approach to the 21st century, in the light of information being appropriated into a commodity as intellectual property. He argues for a generalist approach to tackle three particular problems. Firstly, the compression of ideas for easier digestion, faster consumption, and a greater quantity to feast on. In short, bite-sized reality. In a, in a world of top 10 lists and 500 word articles, one minute 30 second reports and philosophers explained in five minutes, perception takes priority over the concept. Summaries become totalities. As Mackenzie called it in his 1995 work on the Infobarn fantasy, the packaging of culture. Secondly, an oversaturation that paradoxically results in a general ignorance. We live in a world of communication insanity, untraceable facts and parodies of truth. As that renegade Guy Debord put it, a ceaseless circulation of information. Often, as soon as we find a cranny to cling to, we are transported to a new cliff in a land that is only dimly recognisable, with only our misguided attempts in previous habitats to guide us ineffectively. <laughs> Thirdly, information being monopolised by, by what Walk deems the vectorialist class, which stands in contradistinction to the hacker class and seeks to dispossess hackers of their intellectual property their abstractions through bureaucratic processes such as patents and copyrights. In order to combat this malaise, Walk argues in general intellects that different disciplines must work out how different kinds of knowledge of different parts of the intellectual metabolism might cooperate, other than via the commodifi commodification of knowledge as intellectual property. He uses the analogy of sticking our heads above our little cubicles and figuring out how to cooperate with others who understand different parts of the labour process. It is in this time more than ever that we need general intellects and general ideas to help us navigate, quantify and traverse our world of neon shadows, carousels of images and monstrosities of information. As A.C. Grayling posits, ideas are the cogs that drive history and understanding them is halfway to being aboard that powerful juggernaut rather than under its wheels. Mackenzie is joined tonight by Professor Steve Fuller the August Comp Chair in Social Epistemology in the Department of Sociology at the University of Warwick. Steve has written on countless works on the character of the public intellectual in the modern world. All reveal his particular interest in the ethics and politics of public intellectual life, especially given its largely improvisational nature. 
we couldn't think of a more fitting sparring partner for Mackenzie this evening. So, without further ado, let's get started on this treat of an evening. Please join me in welcoming Mackenzie Walk to the stage, who'll kick off the evening with a presentation before he's joined by Steve. Thank you, Tom. Uh, my thanks to uh, Dan O'Hara and uh, Virtual Futures. Uh, and yes, it's true, I was at uh, Virtual Futures in, at Warwick in uh, 1995, and I've been dining out on stories about what happened at that event for 20 years. Uh, so later over drinks, I might retell them for anyone who's, who's still here. It was, was quite a thing. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm just gonna read a little bit about uh, General Intellects. Uh, Steve will rip it to shreds. Uh, and uh, then we can all have a, what you say. <laughs> we can all have a conversation together. All right, when talking about public intellectuals, it's obligatory to talk about their decline. The whole concept of the public intellectual implies a narrative of the fall. Once there were giants who spoke from on high and now they are gone. And there are a variety of culprits of this standard story. They're extinct because of political correctness or academic jargon or identity politics, so the story goes. So I thought it might be useful to just change the language for a start. So rather than public intellectuals, let's talk about general intellects. General intellect is a concept from Marx that I'm quite frankly misusing. In Grundrisse, Marx took an interest in the way what we might call cognition became a part of the forces of production. Machinery, or what Marx called dead labor, replaced living labor, but machinery also embodied in its iron form the cognitive capacities of our species being which he called in English, the general intellect. One could say a lot about the general intellect in Marx, but I want to switch gears and think about general intellects in the plural. I'm going to define general intellects as those whose work is cognitive more than manual, as with a lot of work in the overdeveloped world, and uh, whose work has become part of a general commodification of cognition. As I argued many years ago in a Hacker, Manifesto, a Hacker Manifesto, the property form changed a lot in the late 20th century evolving elaborate forms of intellectual property which come very close to being absolute private property rights. What I then call the hacker class uh, are those whose cognitive effort are caught in a mesh of technical and legal forms. Now, by hacker class, I don't just mean those who hack computer code. Hacker class is all of us who work, whose work is mostly cognitive and which is captured in the form of intellectual property where that intellectual property ends up being owned and or controlled by somebody else. So it doesn't matter if you work with numbers or language or code or images, it's all rendered equivalent as intellectual property. We become, we belong in the same class even though we do different things and have different and complicated identities. We belong in the same class because another class ends up owning or extracting most of the value from the product of our labor, which is information. One of the big stories we're still grappling with is how the effort of cognition could be captured technically as information and how information in its technologized form could be subsumed within the commodity form. But here it's not just a matter of some sort of monstrous eternal commodity form expanding to incorporate ever new things. The becoming commodified of information also changes what the commodity form is. So whatever this mode of production is that we're in, it's just not the same thing as the steam-driven capitalism Marx confronted in the 1850s uh, when he wrote the Grundrisse notebooks. I'm staying in a hotel at St Pancras and I keep thinking about, oh my God, this is so awesome, 19th century, but we don't live here anymore. What if this is not even capitalism anymore, but something worse? I think it's worth risking a new diagnosis of what the mode of production now is and hence who the ruling class or rather classes are these days. Certainly a capitalist class that profits from the ownership of the means of production still exists, just as the landlord class still exists that extracts ground rent, in fact, perhaps even from underneath where we are now. Yeah? Uh, but if we can acknowledge that there were always two kinds of ruling class, landlord and capitalist, as Ricardo knew and Marx knew, why not a third? Why not a new one? So I call the ruling class that emerged more closer to our time the vectoralist class. They do not own land. They do not even own the means of production. Rather, they control the value chain by owning and controlling information. They own the databases, the flows, and above all, the possible vector of storage and transmission 
of information, in the form of intellectual property, in patents, copyrights. More importantly, they own the logistics and protocols, protocols by which the whole of production and reproduction is now controlled. So perhaps this is no longer a world in which we can just sort of apply Marx's concepts or, or anybody else's, maybe with a modifier or two stuck on, on, on the front, neoliberal capitalism, post fordist capitalism. When your modifier has got a modifier on it, you're really messed with language, right? The poet in me just rebels. So it seems a bit unsatisfactory to think there is an unchanging capitalist essence that just changes in its appearances. Perhaps the form of control and exploitation has a new layer to it. The vectorless class, which captures the cognitive effort of the hacker class, to which many of us may belong, and uses that captured cognition, that proprietary information, to control value production, those other <coughs> or still existing uh, modes of production, which might now be subordinate. Now, the vectorless class arose out of the stagnation of the capitalist mode of production in the overdeveloped world in the 70s. Organized labor kept pushing wages up, but the productive process could no longer be made more efficient using uh, in its existing form. The capitalist class looked for answers to what had hitherto been a minor branch of their own industrial base, the owners of information technology. But this turned out to be a devil's bargain for them. Shifting the commodity form away from products to information was in the end to the advantage of owners of information. Uh, just as capitalists had outflanked landlords with a more abstract form of the commodity, so the vectorless class outflanked capitalist class. Look at the composition of leading global firms today, and you'll find that many of them outsource the actual making of things to subordinate fir firms. What they own is information, something of which Marx was unable to form an adequate concept. Marx understood thermodynamics, the leading industrial science of his time, but not information, the techniques of which barely, uh, was just barely beginning to exist. Maybe Marx can't help us with this historical epoch if we treat him as high theory, as a master who looked into the essence of the totality, we might need a different kind of intellectual effort even to think it. Conventional intellectual history gives us the fable of Marx as a singular giant or Weber or like name your master, uh, producing the intellectual synthesis uh, and critique of his age alone. But maybe this is misleading. It was a team effort, even if we do not go quite as far as Alexander Bogdanov who said that it was the organized working class that actually wrote Das Kapital with Marx as merely their stenographer. In any case, what we confront today may be a weirder and more tentacular beast than the vampire capital of Marx's imagination. It might take a collaborative effort to even describe and outline the world in which we live with its relatively novel kinds of exploitation and control. And so the particular quality I want to assign to the general intellects I chose to write about in the book, General Intellects, is that of not just being a part of this subsumption of cognition, but of trying to theorize some aspect of it at the same time. General intellects are both incorporated into machinic systems of dead labor and regimes of intellectual property, while they also try to think about it from within. Now, I'm using the term general intellects for that part of the hacker class that is relatively cognizant of the world it now inhabit, inhabits. But the problem for today's general intellects is that they, or we, are subsumed not into the totality of instrumentalized cognition, but only into some part of it. The work of the general intellect becomes part of the general commodification of cognition. But it's not entirely able to think this because the form in which the general intellect's work is commodified is always itself particular. To the vectorless class, we're all more or less the same as all of us produce information that be, can be commodified, but to each other, we appear as speaking a babel of different languages and holding up the masks of our carnival of different identities to each other. Thus, the attempts by general intellects to think the totality of social and historical life ends up being partial and one-sided the habits of the particular information extraction process in which one works, shapes how one perceives the world, what metaphors one finds most congenial for explaining it, and which forms of intellectual practice one thinks ought to be sovereign over all the others. Thus, if one is trained and works with language, as I was, one does indeed tend to think there's nothing outside the text, whereas if one studies politics, one thinks everything is political, if one is a sociologist, then it's clear reality is socially constructed. 
If one works in economics, then it's economics all the way down. If one is a coder, then everything is just more or less functional code. If you work with turtles, it's turtles all the way down, and so on. Thus, the form in which one is subsumed into commodification divides cognitive workers, hacker class, just as much as the manual working class. We take particular metaphors derived from particular ways of working and thinking as applicable to the whole. Nobody can grasp the totality of social relations from their particular speciality. There are a few traditional solutions to this problem. One is journalism. If general intellects are specialists rather than generalists, then journalists will be specialists who specialize in the general. But it's not working very well. Journalism is comfortable moving between different topics and dividing, uh, diving into them to find out what's at the bottom. But journalism has the habit of fitting the new descriptive material into existing concepts and metaphors about the rest of the world. In the world of journalism, there can be a lot of new particulars, but the general is always the same. Another solution is interior to academic organization, interdisciplinarity. Uh, but it never really quite works as it should. It ended up being a way for disciplines to sort of bunker down in their hollow and hallowed conceptual cores and police their borders. The disciplines, as Steve Fuller says, are a necessary evil, and the more necessary, the more evil. They're a donut-shaped, hyperconscious of their doughy edges, but hollow at the core. A more traditional academic solution is to acknowledge a sovereign discourse. Philosophy has only been too eager to play this role, at least in the context of German, French, or Italian cognitive production. Anglophone philosoph uh, philosophy famously went the other way and became hyper-specialized on the protocols of language and logic upon which the whole industrialization of thought supposedly ran. So philosophers either want to be in charge of the whole or to be indispensable specialists for the language and logic part. And maybe they are useful in both those capacities. It's just that nobody else believes them. Back in the media world, we have a solution these days in the form of thought leaders. The thought leader dispenses with the necessity for academic or literary credentials. The beauty of thought leading, one has to give kick-ass PowerPoint. There's that, I suppose. It's like performance art. Uh, but the beauty of thought leading is that, uh, ooh, I just went backwards, is that one distinguishes a successful thought leader simply by the number of views of their TED talk or the size of their Twitter followership or the frequency of their blog posts. But it rather vitiates the venerable role of intellectual life and having something to say that's not based on exchange value. The thought leader format privileges the one big idea that will change the world in capitals. It flatters the vanity of the vectorless class in its philanthropic mode that it alone can be the benefactor of the magic solution for all our problems. So, you know, uh, Bill Gates will solve it all, that sort of thing. So perhaps we need another path. Before turning to that, I want to map out various ways in which the Marxist tradition has thought about cognitive and intellectual work. And there are others, it's just those are my people, so that's the way I think the past. And here I'm uh, drawing freely on two authors actually cover in the book, General Intellects, Franco Berardi and Angela McRobbie. So let me briefly sketch out where we've been on this topic so we can think about how to tackle it next. Marx inherited two models of the intellectual. The enlightenment figure of the intellectual as bearer of universal reason, the romantic figure of the intellectual as spirit of the people. And the Marxist intellectual is supposed to be a synthesis of both, but where reason can no longer be contemplative, Reason must engage in practice in and against the world, and where the people with whom the intellectual practices reason are not a nation but a class. At the time, the new industrial working class. Such intellectuals are imagined to be disaffected or marginalized members of the bourgeoisie, such as Engels himself, for example. But rather than focus on the intellectual inheritance Marx and his followers had to work with, perhaps we could also think about their means of communication and organization. The labor movement grew with the railways, the telegraph, the newspaper, and perhaps also in part because of them. They make it possible for a mass movement to communicate and know itself. Marx was, let's not forget, a journalist more than a philosopher, a very good one. This expanding vector of telegraph and newspaper, uh, then augmented by telephony, was the communication infrastructure of the labor movement at its peak uh, around the end of the 19th century. It was said of the uh, German Social Democrats uh, at their peak, that they'd rather open a new journal than form a new branch. Yeah, that was very much a media apparatus. On top of that infrastructure, Kautsky and Lenin built an intellectual cadre 
uh, of a professional revolutionary party. Armed with the infallible and self-correcting method of dialectical materialism, the party is supposed to be the agent of totality, bringing the local and particular impulses of organized labor with its trade unions together in the service of achieving socialism. And the key figure for them is the professional organizer. Uh, the young George Lukash made the mistake of trying to further subordinate not just the trade unions to the party, but the party to the party philosopher. So they smacked him down for that. Now there's a different emphasis in Antonio Gramsci, where what's more interesting is the idea of the organic intellectual, who might rise up out of the skilled uh, and organized fractions of the working class itself. And it's an idea, incidentally, that Gramsci may partly have got from Lenin's rival and nemesis, Alexander Bogdanov. In Gramsci, the intellectual world becomes not just a supplement, but a field of struggle in its own right. There's a struggle for intellectual leadership to build a counter-hegemonic culture. As one of the bases of social transformation in parallel to the struggle at the side of production, but subordinated to it. The means at Gramsci's disposal were still those of the era of telegraphy, telephone, newspaper, literature, and so on. Whether in its Leninist or Gramscian form, the party exercised a certain fascination over intellectuals from the October Revolution in 1917, happy anniversary or not, to the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956, uh, at which point it was definitely in crisis. Uh, throughout that time, the party built its own media and educational apparatus, its own schools, its own journals, even its own novelists and filmmakers. It built what Alexander Kluger uh, called a counter-public sphere. The party gave rise to a whole new category as well, the fellow traveler. Uh, I'll mention just two. Uh, firstly, Pierre Paolo Pasolini, a one-man media machine more or less aligned with but independent of the Italian Communist Party. He wrote poems, novels, articles, made movies and television. So you got to really hate him because he was good at everything. He kept alive something of a romantic image of the proletariat within the emerging mass media vector that was superseding the literary and cultural apparatus of Gramsci's time. Secondly, Jean-Paul Sartre tried for a time to stake out a position for a committed intellectual outside the party, unanswerable to its discipline, while he still acknowledged Marxism as the horizon for thought, uh, you know, of which the party was supposed to be the repository of all wisdom. Uh, and the, the Sartrean intellectual is a universal intellectual, addressing himself to a sort of riven and alienated totality. Sartre tried and did not really succeed in subsuming difference into this universality. Uh, but these days, I think one thinks of Sartre now alongside Simone de Beauvoir, but also France Fanon and Jean Genet. Uh, it's in the shadow of Sartrean commitment and universality, perhaps, that we learned about difference. Here, a path opens toward what Foucault is going to call the specific intellectual, committed not to the totality, but to the political consequences of his or her own speciality. Now, at odds with all this uh, Sartrean commitment and its fellow traveling and its plunge into events is the tactical withdrawal of, say, Theodore Adorno, taking refuge in art from the extorted reconciliation that exchange value forces onto pro the products of cognitive work, although even to describe it like that is to betray Adorno's dialectical language. Now, we think of Adorno now as a sort of hermit writer, a bit austere and remote, but he was a public figure in post-war Germany. Uh, instrumental in creating a non-fascist culture. Uh, his Minima Moralia, believe it or not, was a bestseller. Uh, but then there's also a more engaged version of the Frankfurt legacy, a kind of Hegelese for beginners, uh, attention to alienation rather than production. In Sartre, alienation is just the human condition, whereas in Herbert Marcuse, it can be overcome, if not by labor now subsumed into capital and by other social agents who get to be the bunny who's the agent of history. Marcuse cuts an unlikely figure in the post-war counterculture wearing a suit and tie in the California sun. He was a paperback hero, his books circulating widely in the mass print intellectual culture of the post-war period. Uh, anyone seen that movie? Um, uh, I saw it last night in the hotel room, uh, Hail Caesar. There's a like fantastic portrait of the Marcuse of your imagination in, in that movie. I recommend it. Um, but anyway, uh, this sort of like mass paperback uh, intellectual. Uh, it was there to sort of meet the vast expansion of higher education in the post-war period uh, all over the developed world. So the idea of the paperback theory book is a kind of post-war invention. All right, so Pasolini, Sartre, Adorno, Marcuse, 
are versions of an intellectual practice that owes something to Marx but does not belong in the end to the party or even to the industrial working class. All occupied positions that afforded them a certain autonomy of thought and action, either as successful authors in the case of Pasolini and Sartre, or within the expanding and reconstructed university in the case of Adorno and Marcuse. They vary enormously in political and theoretical outlook, but share the same infrastructure of the mass print, mass education vector of the post-war period. They became players within the spectacle, whether they wanted to or not. Now, Althusser is a different story, even though he was a university professor like Adorno and Marcuse, indirectly connected to mass intellectual publishing through an influential book series, but he was a party member, probably more sympathetic to the Maoists than the Stalinists. Althusser introduces two innovations, though. One was his insistence on the relative autonomy and distinctive materiality of the political and ideological uh, levels. Politics and ideology are not just forms of appearance of an economic essence. And this was enormously enabling, maybe too enabling, for those who preferred to specialise in the political or the ideological. French political theory, Anglophone cultural studies owes a lot to that moment. Now, Althusser's second innovation is a little bit trickier. It's the idea of a theoretical practice. Sounds like an oxymoron. Like the young Lukács, although in a completely different idiom, Althusser makes philosophy the sovereign discourse. Theoretical praxis is supposed to be in charge of the epistemological rigor of all the other practices, particularly those newfangled ones in the expanded university like communication or technology studies. Once again, the party was not very happy about this usurping of their role, Althusser recanted, but the idea of philosophy as sovereign has not gone away and it left his traces in his student Alain Badiou, for instance, where philosophy remains one of those privileged routes to authentic subjectivity, along with poetry, mathematics, and something else, I forget. Now there's a lot of variations and alternatives to these more canonic versions of uh, the Marxist intellectual. Uh, a few cute ones worth a quick mention. The Social Relations of Science Movement, strongest in Britain from the, who's heard of the Social Relations of Science Movement? Oh yes, two. All right, I still have to write the book on it though, right? Because everybody else needs to know. Social Relations of Science Movement. All right, strong in Britain in the 30s, surviving through to the 50s. I think we've sort of neglect, it's a, a neglected version of intellectual practice that had more to do with the model of the scientific worker and less to do with the philosopher or literary intellectual. It was an early version of an intellectual practice uh, organic, maybe, of and by the hacker class. Uh, so in Gramscian terms, for all the differences, Lukács, Althusser, Sartre, Marcuse, they're all traditional intellectuals formed in an ancient university culture. The social relations of science movement grew out of organic intellectual practices, out of a new nexus between science and industry, but it tended to fellow travel with communist parties pretty hard. It was forced into near extinction by Cold War black bands. It was anathema to the new left, which tended to the more romantic rather than enlightened side of Marx's inheritance, not to mention a touch of nostalgia for traditional intellectual life. Second movement worth a mention is the ultra-left avant-garde, of which the more aesthetically inclined are like more fun. Yep. For example, Situationist International, which did its best to refuse the party and the academy, even if it came a bit too close to the art world and private patronage, Kinderbord, it turns out, is, is a very contemporary character. He had private patrons his whole uh, professional intellectual life. Uh, I find the situations particularly interesting in that they were, to mix terminologies, organic intellectuals of the spectacle, of the rising forces of production, of the overdeveloped world. Michelle Bernstein, who was uh, Guy Debord's first patron, had a long career in advertising. Uh, who's seen the TV show Mad Men? All right. So if you can think of Michelle Bernstein as a slightly older and French version of Peggy Olsen. <laughs> Kid you not. Uh, when, I, when I met her, I thought, everybody talks to her about Guy Debord. I'm not going to do that. So I asked her about her professional life. And it's like, this, she told me this story. That's who she was. She worked in advertising. Now, the situation this great discovery was detournement, or the refusal of intellectual property. They're precursors to the theory and practice uh, of the commons in intellectual life. Thirdly, I won't deal with the Trotskyist version of this distance from Stalinist practices, uh, noble as it was. The thing about uh, Trotsky's followers is that they're always right about everything. They always are correct in theory and practice, and it's just not very interesting. Uh, the apparent co-option of the labor movement in some parts of the overdeveloped world 
the rise of a mass intellectual formation through the expansion of the university led to a shift in attention from the exploitation of labor to a more generalized category of alienation. And whereas for Sartre, uh, alienation was inevitable. For Adorno, non-reconciliation was the truth of art. Uh, for Marcuse, the overthrow of capitalism might still offer prospects for a reconciliation of the human with the world it produces. Uh, here's where uh, Mario Tronti and those who followed him uh, in Italy had a unique contribution. And the novel idea here is that the alienation of the worker from his or her labor is to be acknowledged, extended, and even desired. The working class ought really to produce itself outside of this alienating uh, productive world of capital. It should become self-valorizing, autonomous, and struggle to refuse work and to be as free from it as possible. There's a great movie called The Working Class Goes to Heaven that's kind of all about that. Uh, something analogous, uh, although in a completely different idiom, comes out of uh, Stuart Hall, British Cultural Studies, this focused less on the refusal of labor and more on the creating of a working class culture uh, outside of work in leisure time. Uh, and this is also where questions of difference really started to enter uh, Marxist or now post-Marxist discourse. The labor process makes all of labor equivalent, but in leisure, the worker recreates himself uh, in his difference. Only maybe he is not a he. Maybe she experiences patriarchal oppression or homophobia or racism. And once labor is no longer the primary category, Differences in experience and the intellectual articulation come into their own. So, whether it was derived from the idea of an autonomous social life with the Italians, putting politics in command with the French, or the long cultural revolution with the English, there's a turn away from thinking the economic and technical transformation in a lot of the prominent intellectual work that went through in the 80s onwards, but it represents uh, a clear blockage of sort of industrial struggle and a sort of transference of hope elsewhere. But here's the thing. The generalization of information technology as the vector of control did not just transform labor, it transformed those spheres of non-labor as well. Leisure time was already well understood to be something organized by the culture industry or subject to hegemonic culture, but there's still a sense in which leisure time was free time. But now not only labor, but non-labor can be captured and information extracted from it and value produced. So even when you're not working, you're working for Google or Apple or Facebook, your non-labor too can be made equivalent as information, value extracted from it, and you don't get paid for it. It's like, could you please exploit me for this? It's like, no, you're giving it away for free. So social, political, or cultural en energy and autonomy has been captured again in the form of information and rendered productive in the service of what I would call vectorless class. And while I think there's no going back to the old language that subordinated everyone's struggle uh, and experienced the language of class, I think there's a new way in which the language of class helps understand a new kind of commonality in experience, even though experience itself is now experienced as a sort of kaleidoscope of intersectional differences. Those differences are the very thing that the vectorless class gathers and sorts and extracts a surplus from. We all became producers of surplus information. Identity politics is harvested as the free labor of defining oneself as a target for niche marketing. This is something of a commonplace observation now, but I don't want to pay tribute to those who saw all of this coming. It's perhaps not an accident that the best analysis and conceptualization and critique of the emerging post-broadcast mass media vector happened in and against the emerging forms of that media. The internet avant-garde of the 80s and 90s formed the concepts with which to describe this state of affairs. They dispensed with many of the habits of thought of the old style intellectuals. Uh, they developed new practices, such as what my uh, nettime.org comrades called collaborative filtering. There was a silver age of social media uh, when the long arm of commodification had not quite reached it or been transformed by it when nobody really knew how to extract surplus information from it. Yes, there was a silver age of social media in the 80s and 90s, but it will have no golden age. I want to briefly pay tribute to some of those I remember from that world. Diane McCarthy, Pitt Schultz, Hit Loving, Brian Holmes, Wendy Chun, Alex Galloway, Tiziana Terranova, Lisa Nakamura, Coco Fusco, Matt Fuller, Kodo Ishin, Arthur Croker, Manuel Delanda, Richard Barbrook, Barbrook good evening, Richard and the late Andy Cameron. 
I want to mention some of the forms of avant-garde collective action and digital intellectual organization that were among the experiments of the period. Electronic Disturbance Theatre, Critical Art Ensemble, VNS Matrix, the Barbie Liberation Organization, bless them. The Yes Men, the Institute for Applied Autonomy, Bureau des Etudes, Rax Media Collective, Old Boys Network, which was a feminist organization. Net Time, Sarai, Rhizome, Fiber Culture, Undercurrents, Backspace, Mama, Recombinant, and of course, Virtual Futures. We were all fellow travelers of each other without a party. I mention all this because the myth has got about that a bunch of Silicon Valley venture vectoralists invented this brave new world all on their own. This was never the case, no matter what their publicists say. And to the extent that the social media vector still affords us a degree of freedom and agency, it's due to the efforts not specifically to those avant-garde and critical thinkers, but to the social movements around free information, information rights, and information justice, of which they were the general intellects. Basically, I think one of the templates for a practice for general intellects comes out of that world. It's not one that has master thinkers or public intellectuals, nor is it quite the world of specific intellectuals of Foucault, which sort of becomes hostage to the academy again. The key term I take from this subset of social media avant-garde of the 80s and 90s is what on net time we call collaborative filtering. And the way I think that uh, and the practices that have migrated out of the listserv culture of the 90s via blog culture uh, the last dec decade, that's what General Intellects is kind of about. So the challenge then is to try to collaboratively produce an autonomous conceptual understanding of the current mode of production while knowing full well that this mode of production is designed to algorithmically harvest such concepts and turn them into marketing categories and investment opportunities. One has to work both in and against the vector, in and against information as a commodity form, but which might yet have other affordances. In an earlier moment, the situation as practice of detournement or appropriation or the commons seemed like a good idea, except that this got co-opted at a higher level of extraction, abstraction and extraction by the vectorless class. Google's a key example. It depends on other people making information free so it can control the metadata about where all that data is to be found and the order in which it ought to be found. Hence, merely making things free is not any more a viable strategy. So in the 90s, a lot of us were data punks. Uh, here's three megabytes, now form your own techno label, uh, as some people did. Uh, but now we need to be meta data punks. Did you say data or data in, in England? Data. 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 Sorry, I've, I've been in America too long. So let's create our own maps of the information vector. One way to do it is with concepts. Now, if a good fact is mostly true about something in particular, a good concept is slightly true about a lot of things. It's a very simple epistemology, but let's, right, let's have that for a start. Concepts are compressed, easily transmissible packets of information. But nobody has all the concepts they need to hand. We all work with particular slices of the information in particular ways and tend to map the world as if it were more or less the same as the bit we know. And so in general intellects, I made a compressed map of the territory adjacent to my own field, which is media theory. General intellects is a book about other writers of theory. There's 21 sections and each of them is a quick economical approach to recent or key work. Most are academic, some are well known, others are not but should be. Uh, the book starts with two distinctive takes on the Marxist tradition from Amy Wendling and Cochin Karatani to bring out questions of technology uh, and to sort of decenter the West Eurocentric view a bit. Then we move on to Italian and French writers in something like the autonomous tradition, Paolo Verno, Franco Berardi, Yamali Butang, Maurizio Lazzarato. I was on a panel with him two days ago. Uh, next come two people from British Cultural Studies, Angela McRobbie and Paul Gilroy. Uh, to psychoanalytically inclined, uh, Slavoj Žižek, we've heard of him, right? Uh, Jody Dean, uh, political theory with uh, Chantal Mouffe, I put that one in just for Richard. Uh, Wendy Brown and Judith Butler, two theorists of corporeality, uh, Paul B. Preciado and Hiroki Azuma. A little bit of my home turf and people from the net time world, uh, Wendy Chun and Alex Galloway. Uh, a little bit of speculative realism. I did a bit on Tim Morton, uh, Quantum Miyasu. Um, we end with uh, science studies with Isabel Stenger's Donna Haraway. And these pieces, they're all only about uh, 4,000 words. They're appreciations, but critical ones. 
Critical perspective is informed by three things. Firstly, attention to how the forces of production have changed. Secondly, as I put it in the subtitle to Molecular Red, really ought to be doing theory for the Anthropocene. I mean, call it something else if you want, but we sort of have to think that. Not all our authors get that far. Thirdly, something I learned in the digital avant-garde of the 90s, life is too short for arguments. In each chapter, I try to map out where I think each theorist is useful and where they're not. I also map them uh, onto each other, a little bit onto my own research. But I don't argue too much with them. So the problem with knowledge production is that each field tries to make itself sovereign and argues with the other. And the book tries to practice a sort of collaborative knowledge production uh, that actually got out of uh, Alexander Bogdanov. Some, but not all, of the people in this book have those amazing jobs in American universities where you can write and think and do whatever you like. I do not have one of those jobs. These luxury jobs have a downside in that what the people with these sinecures produce tends to get a little bit baroque. The writing ends up being luxury writing. Now, you can buy their books for about $20, but you need $100,000 worth of graduate school to unpack them. Now, I've done uh, what you're no, not supposed to do with this writing. I've instrumentalized it, stripped it down to the concepts, shown how they work, shown how it connects to writing by others who work without those luxuries. So General Intellects is a bit compressed, but it's a book that's meant to be useful. I stripped out the good bits so you can grab hold of them and use them and make your own writing, your own art, your own design. So it's like, here's like, you know, 21 chords, form your own band, basically. Or your own techno label. Uh, so, oh yeah, I wrote that, I didn't need to improvise it. Here's 100,000 words of highly distilled, uh, highly distilled into low theory, do with whatever you want with it, and happy travels. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Mackenzie. It's a world of exploitation, misflip pages, madmen, carnivals of identity, and I guess academics obsessed with turtles then. Oh, the, the compression of the compression. <laughs> yeah, compression. Awesome. Meta compression, yeah. inception compression. I suppose this also counts as working leisure too, in a strange way. And to respond, I'd like to welcome Professor Steve Fuller to the stage. He'll give a short talk before the two of them have a discussion. Let us hope this collaboration is fruitful and we can reach a slight truth about the concept of the intellectual in the 21st century. Okay, don't have your expectations too high. Um, but first of all, I, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank uh, um, the, the organizers for uh, inviting me to respond to Mackenzie. Uh, I, I've been following your work for a while and this is a good opportunity to sort of, of catch up. Uh, and um, I guess I would say that I approach uh, this matter of the public intellectual uh, from a somewhat different starting point. Uh, namely, I don't take for granted that academics have ever been natural public intellectuals, that, that in a sense, um, the two categories sort of uh, overlap to a certain extent, but, but um, in a sense, they're also intrinsically oppositional to each other. Uh, and um, and you've, you were alluding to this, actually, especially toward the end of your talk, um, and that is there's a sense in which insofar as academic knowledge production involves expertise, um, there is always going to be a, a kind of barrier placed uh, before the public. And, and I think you know, the way we express this most normally in, in, in academic life is first of all in the technical nature of the journal articles that we have to write, which become kind of the currency by which we are judged as you know, people who matter right, in the academy. Uh, and that immediately draws you away from, from public discourse, but also uh, within the classroom experience as well. Uh, and this is, in a, in a way, one of the more unfortunate features of academic life, which I don't think it was meant to be that way. But nevertheless, the way in which authority is exercised in a classroom is in terms of if students ask a question that, in a sense, is not informed or sufficiently informed by what they're supposed to be reading, Right, they get slapped down basically, and, and the teacher feels under no obligation actually to take the student's question at its face. Now in public intellectual life, that's not allowed. And if you do that in public intellectual life, you're out of the room, okay? Uh, and so in this respect, most academics can't even get into the room uh, because there's, there's a sense in which they have a kind of learned helplessness with regard to the public. Okay, and this is a term from Thorstein Veblen in the beginning of the 20th century, and he was in fact talking about academics in the early 20th century with regard to this. And so when I look at this book, The General Intellects, this is the frame of mind I come to it. Um, and I think, you know, if you were listening to what Mackenzie was saying at the very end when he's giving you a kind of precy of what's going on in the book, uh, 
I think you begin to see what the problems are with treating these people as public intellectuals, okay? First of all, there is, and, and, and this goes in a way to the way you deal with them, actually, because it is true that you do do this kind of, you know, splice and dice and, and you know, Chicken McNuggets approach to distilling all the important things that these people have to say in 4,000 words, but it's largely for purposes of consumption, I would say, within the academy, perhaps. Uh, maybe uh, a couple of journalists might pick up some concepts they could use, um, but it seems to me at most what this does is facilitate a kind of um, uh, interstitial discussion among the 21 people being talked about. I think that's pretty much. Uh, and, and in a sense, this also captures kind of the spirit of what you're actually trying to promote. And this is why I wonder whether we're really talking about public intellectuals at all in any sense, because it seems to me that part of what you want to do uh, is uh, that you want to collectivize this group of people, right? The group of people and the, and the kind of viewpoints that they represent in your book, okay? Now, uh, for those of you who, who kind of range widely in intellectual life, uh, you know, looking at those 21 people, who are, of course, quite different with regard to various things, are coming, there are enough common assumptions, enough kind of intellectual constraints that are already operating that provide a kind of natural forum for, for trading ideas and stuff, as Mackenzie illustrates very well in the book, but one that at the same time excludes a lot of the rest of the world. Okay, so for example, in this book, I would say, for virtually everyone in the book, and certainly the way you treat them, uh, Marxism is like the Bible, in a sense. And I mean the Bible in, 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 in a full kind of understanding of the Bible. Namely, it's kind of a template, right? So even though we have different kinds of readings, right, as you do of the Bible, and people emphasize different books of the Bible, right, and certain key moments and, and things like this. Nevertheless, that is the matrix, in a sense. Uh, in Marxism is the matrix, uh, uh, you know, in which the whole thing is unfolding. And in fact, you're actually quite good in actually showing the relevance of this kind of Marxist matrix, even to people who aren't on the surface very Marxist, okay? Um, and, and so this is something that I think is, you, you got to kind of buy into very much at the outset. Now, one problem I have with this uh, from the standpoint of the idea of public intellectual life is that public intellectual life doesn't take Marxism for granted, right? There's a sense in which the temp, you know, whatever you want to call the template that's the starting point for public intellectual life, right? Even a, even a phrase as, as straightforward as forces of production right, seems a bit alien to the public, even though that's one of the simpler terms in the Marxist discourse, which is, of course, part of the common currency. So there's a sense in which even if you were to succeed on your own terms with regard to collectivizing these people and, and getting them to be kind of on the same page and moving direct, you know, moving together in some sort of fashion, um, you, you haven't really accomplished quite that much with regard to the issue that you need to be addressing, at least by your own standards, right? Because you're worried about the Anthropocene, right? You're worried about the end of the world, right? And, and a lot of your people, are, you know, go on and on about the end of the world, actually. Timothy Morton probably being the most ecstatic one. Um, but the, and, and, and yet, you know, you, you, what you're aiming for at this point is still so far away from what would engage with the, you know, with the power that could actually change any of the things that, to a large extent, you rightly see as wrong with the world, right? So there's a sense in which we're, you know, you, you know, that the, 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 the ambition, to be honest with you, is not as, it, 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 there's a lot of words, it's very sophisticated, it's very intellectually interesting, but, but the ambition in terms of what you claim to be the ultimate task, which is to change the world, which is, of course, the public intellectual task, Right, Jean-Paul Sartre, all that kind of stuff, all on board with that. Um, you're really far away to getting to the starting gate, okay? Um, and, and, and so I want to say some, you know, see, in this regard, it's interesting what the problem is, I think, with, with what you're doing. Because one of your heroes that you didn't, you, you, you almost mentioned his name, I don't think you quite did, but when you were talking about the social relations of science movement, right, John Desmond Bernal. Okay, uh, have any of you heard of him? He was the great Marxist uh, X-ray crystallographer, trained the people who, uh, in fact, uh, discovered the, the double helix structure of DNA, but he didn't get a Nobel Prize himself because he was too busy campaigning and doing other things, but very smart man, okay? Uh, he had his lab at Birkbeck College here, 
uh, and he was great Marxist. He brought all of the great Marxist historians in 1937 to a big conference in London, um, and, and he was really kind of a firebrand and a real public intellectual on the Marxist side of the issue, okay? Um, and one of the things, one of his ambitions, and you, you talk about this a bit in your book, was that in a sense, uh, once it looked like the, you know, once it looked like the proletariat revolution, uh, as originally conceptualized by Marx, wasn't quite going the way it was supposed to go, that there would be a sense in which one would organize scientific workers of the world. And the scientific workers would be a kind of, you know, informed proletariat that actually could take over the means of production, because in the early 20th century, they were already being insinuated into all parts of the means of production, whether we're talking about business or the military or anything like that. And the scientists were the brains behind all this, and, 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 you know, and, 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 you know, if you were actually to get them, as it were, to get into some kind of international union, right, they could have an enormous amount of power, right? Now that's what Bernal was going after, okay? Uh, and that's what always made him throughout his career a somewhat dangerous guy, okay? Um, but he actually had a lot of influence. The influence, of course, turned out to be quite diffuse because, of course, this great union never took place. Uh, but one person I would just mention in passing because he only died a couple of years ago and he's relevant to sort of environmental concerns is Barry Commoner. Uh, in the United States, right? Barry Commoner, one of the leading ecologists in the United States, uh, who actually ran for president at one point. Um, and, and he was inspired, actually, to get into this kind of politically, you know, think about ecology from a politically active perspective, which led him to complain about things like nuclear radiation, right, and, and air pollution and water pollution and all this kind of stuff from a scientific standpoint, okay, was listening to Bernal at Harvard when he was doing a, a, a tour. because. Bernal in the early 1930s thought that with the Great Depression, right, that this may be the moment where there's a collapse of capitalism, right, because people would begin, and so Bernal was going to kind of move and start organizing the troops, as it were. Uh, he didn't get very far, but he inspired a lot of people in the process. Well, what ended up sinking this project of Bernal's uh, was the fact that um, it really became, it was impossible for scientists to develop class consciousness. Right, in the appropriate Marxist sense. In other words, they were primarily affiliated with whomever was paying their paycheck. And, right, and so it wasn't possible, actually, to speak across those kinds of very significant institutional, economic, political barriers. Okay? Now, if you compare the task that Bernal was putting for himself, which is a very, very enormous task, right? and, and in a way, we're not too surprised it failed. Okay? Um, and you compare it to what your task is, your task is relatively minuscule because you're trying to overcome jargon, basically. You're trying to overcome intellectual differences, most of which, and I think you admit this, are manufactured within the academy itself. Right? Uh, so, you know, uh, so you, you were talking about sovereignty, issues of sovereignty, right? The uh, intellectual sovereignty. And it is, it is always very striking that, you know, whenever academics... Um, start saying, oh, intellectual property is bad, you know, and, and we got to overturn this in the vectoral class and all this kind of stuff. Um, you think about how academics operate, right? That in a sense, what academics do, right, in order to maintain their own basis of power within the academy is in fact to engage in forms of intellectual property, which is conveyed through certain kinds of technical discourses, certain kinds of credentialing, where you have to, you know, you know, spend hundred thousand dollars on an education. I think you mentioned that in passing, right? In order to get to the point where anyone takes you seriously, right? It's a high entry cost, as the economists would say. Again, an obstacle to any kind of public intellectual engagement. Okay. Um, now, so, so there's a sense in which if you compare Bernal's aspiration in terms of the kinds of barriers he was trying to break down to create this kind of you know, uh, universal class of scientific workers versus you know, trying to break down the barriers you're trying to break down in order to create this class of general intellects, right? You know, you're small potatoes by comparison to Bernal, and yet it's a struggle, as you yourself point out so well. Okay? So that's the interesting point, right? It's a struggle. It's not like I'm saying that it's easy to do what he's doing, but the point is even if he did it, we're really nowhere near where we need to be with regard to public intellectual life and the possible transformation of the world because there's still this business of how do you connect to power in the, in the, re in the sense that matters, right? The forces of production in your term, in a, in a real meaningful sense. Now here I want to say a little bit about uh, journalism. Okay, uh, because uh, you, you have some disparaging things to say about journalism, and it's very much uh, common, uh, actually, to get this kind of thing, especially from the academic side of intellectual life. Uh, but I want to say something positive about journalism, and it has a lot to do uh, 
um, with the, the, the way the world has been ever since we started producing a surplus of academic people in the universities. Uh, namely, there are no jobs for them in the university, right? You may have run, that, run across that phenomenon. There are no jobs for all these people who've paid $100,000, you know, just to be able to sit at the feet of some, you know, intellectual guru. Um, and, and so what happens is they often go into journalism, they go into the media more generally, you know, in all the different parts of the media, so producing shows as well, not just writing. Um, and um, this is actually, I think, has had an elevating effect in public discourse, okay? So in other words, the spillover effect from the surfeit of academically trained people in our society, right, uh, actually has been, in a way, doing some of the relevant public intellectual work, and in a sense, we, we need to respect that and, and, and kind of um, be more favorably inclined to it. Because I can tell you, you know, just based on the way my own, because you, as you know, those of you who know something about academic politics these days, know that there's a great push for engagement, right? Research has to be engaged, because there's a, there's a general, you know, understanding that uh, academic research doesn't connect enough with the public, not even with policymakers, you know, not even in an instrumental way, let alone in any more kind of edifying or critical way. Um, and so there's a pressure actually being put on us to do this. Academics find this incredibly difficult. And of course, the, it's the media side that's the problem, right? It's those journalists. They misrepresent everything I say. They, they misinterpret me, you know, uh, and, and I only do it once and never again will I do it. This is a very typical kind of story you get from, from these people, um, from academics, that is, with regard to journalists. I think this is, this is a very bad way to look at it, and I think but the reason why I think academics tend to regard journalism this way is because I think academics, again, operating on the assumption that in some sense they ought to be driving the public intellectual process, even if they're not very good at it. That in some sense it's their ideas, it's their, you know, and that in some sense the journalists ought to be kind of the midwives, you know, and they ought to be the ones who are somehow uh, enabling uh, all of these, uh, you know, brilliant ideas that too bad I can't actually say them in straight English getting to the public, right? But if, of course, when we're talking about journalists in the way they are, they are now in terms of their training, um, they have an independence of mind, okay? Uh, and, they're, and they're not stupid, and they are knowledgeable. And, and, there is, and there is a sense in which these are the people who, in a sense, probably do the most to construct whatever public sphere there is and whatever public discourse there is, okay? And insofar, as those of us in the academy who consider ourselves intellectuals or inspiring intellectuals find ourselves in, in, in opposition to these people in some kind of fundamental way, I think we're sort of missing the point of what our target is. Okay? Because part of, you know, if you want to talk about public intellectual life, you have to be able to connect with the public. Okay? Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, that, that, of course, you want to raise the public or do, change the public's mind. Of course you want to do all that. And that's what intellectuals have done in the past. But the point is you have to connect with the public. That's a very fundamental, basic kind of thing. Um, and so I am, not, I, mean, I mean, I do think that some of the people that you talk about, um, you know, so let's take somebody like Slavo Žižek, okay? Slavo Žižek is probably the guy of all the people you talk about who I think, you know, uh, comes closest to being a public intellectual in a sense that looks a little bit like Sartre. Little bit, little bit, kind of, I don't know. You know, hi history. Hi yeah, I was going to say history <laughs> happens twice. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, in a kind of a Louis Napoleon kind of way. Yeah, um, yeah. And 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 but the, there are interesting. But there's some things about this guy, about Zizek. Even though he is a guy who sells enormous amounts of books, and everybody, you know, all students love to flock to, to his lectures. First of all, it is very telling. This guy hates teaching. Right? He hates teaching. He is very restrictive with regard to kinds of questions he gets whenever he does one of his stand-up routines. Right? This is not a guy who engages. He may be a guy who persuades, okay? And here I would say that the reason why Zizek is able to persuade is because this guy is mooching off of capital that has been, de intellectual capital has been developed from the last two generations once Marx and Freud started to be seen as somehow common travelers. Right? So starting in the late 1960s with the Frankfurt School and all the rest of that, and of course Lacan and, and, and the French side of this, and, and now we've had two generations of, uh, of academically trained people you know, repeating this stuff and extending this stuff and, and even vulgarizing this stuff that was only a matter of time before somebody like Zizek would be able you know, to steal the stage. <laughs> 
right? Because people already know this stuff implicitly. He's not telling them anything they don't know. This is why this is a man who preaches to the converted, right? And he has no... He, yeah, yeah, and, he, and this is why he has, as far as being a general public intellectual is concerned, he has no effect because he is preaching to the converted. He doesn't make anyone feel guilty, right? Except they, no, he makes them feel they have guilty pleasures, right? He doesn't, he, he's not the conscience of the society, right? He is just reproducing what you already think, okay? And the fact that this is the closest that academics can get to a public intellectual says something about how far away we are from where we ought to be. Okay, um, I, I'm, I've been going on for a while. I hadn't realized I was gonna have so much to say about this, but. Um, I'll take that as a good sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but it, it seems to me that, that, that if we are going to be serious about being public intellectuals, I must say, while I do find your book very useful as a kind of guide to some people who at the moment are seen as quite interesting thinkers for our time, I think these people that you're talking about aren't really, as the book advertises, because I'm looking at the back of the book now, and the book is, is, is said, a guide to the thinkers and ideas that will shape the future. No, this is not how I see these people. Um, I see them more as sort of ecstatic representations of the present. Right, so in other words, these are the, the symptoms of frustration of intellectual life. Right, so these are people who can come up with very clever ideas, uh, you know, to capture where we are now. You know, um, you know and, and, and this is what these guys, so, so from the standpoint of historians of the future, these people will be very interesting. Right, they will probably be most interesting to a historian of the future trying to figure out what was going through those, the minds of those people in the early 21st century, these guys actually capture it very well, because they're really turned, you know, they're sort of turned on in a way, right? But is this a guide to the future? No, because they actually have no way of projecting forward, right? Because they have no sense of getting beyond the frameworks in, which enable them to see as well as they can about the current situation. And, and, and they, you know, and I, by the way, because uh, you wrote a couple of years ago, and uh, when, when the Cyborg Manifesto had its 30th anniversary, um, you, you, uh, you wrote a, a piece saying we need another cyborg manifesto. And my view, I mean, again, people, you've got to look at that document from the 1980s, and it's a document from the 1980s. That's where it belongs, right? And what we don't need is, as it were, another snapshot of the time we're in, as it were, you know, a kind of 2015 version, the snapshot of 2015. Well, that's, while that's great for historians who do an autopsy on our times, it is not at all clear that this is the kind of thinking and writing that will actually get us to a kind of future that we want to be living in. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. I'll just say a couple of things and then the audience can have, can have their turn. Um, can, I, can I quote you on uh, ecstatic representation of the present? Because yeah. that, that's gold. And, uh, and, Go right ahead, and, man. And Leo, no trademark Leo, issues. when we do the ne next edition, that's got to be in the copy. Because uh, like... Yeah, but because <laughs> like mo most, frankly, I find most books, you know, I was just in foils today, but most books are about 20 years ago. So if you can represent now, yeah. you're doing well. They're doing that. And, and yes. that's, that's why I actually think Cyber Manifesto, yes, it, it represents 1983 or 4 when it was written. Yeah. But in 1983 or 4, most stuff you read was about 1973. That's true. Uh, no, so I'll take true. that. Um, uh, I make no apologies for, for a sort of doing marks. I, my first teachers were. Uh, militants of organized labor and my commitment to the memory of them because they're mostly dead uh, I, I'm not going to give it up Th those are my people I'm not asking uh, you to give it yeah, up don't worry. yeah and I realize it's not everybody's people but that's that's where I'm from and where we'll forever be uh, to some extent I have to say I think you know I'm, I belong to a defeated people like we lost uh, it's and it's a project that so why are you trying to guide the future well, I, I think it's progress. It's progress to know that you've lost. Like to the oh. people who read are the people who knew they lost, because then they have to think again. The people who think they're the winners actually don't know what they're thinking. Uh, so that would be why why I would do that. Um, thank you for the Bernal Barry Common link. Yeah, so I yeah, never yeah. thought about that. Yeah, yeah. And the people I'm talking about pressed Barry Commoner into my hands in 1978. Uh, 
I had not thought of a Bernal connection. I'm so glad you mentioned Thorsten Veblen, who's one of the founders of the New School for Social Research, where yeah, I absolutely. taught for 13 years. And I love his, his whole thing about uh, luxury goods, and, and which academia was one of his examples. Um, that was one of the things in the back of my mind doing this whole project. So I'm sort of glad that, even though his name's not in it, I'm glad that came out. Mm -hmm. And he and Bernal are not that far apart in thinking about who the social actor would be. That's right. Uh, Veblen's more that's interested true, in engineers. That's true. Um, that's right. No, no, that's yeah. a good point, actually. Yeah. Uh, and and Bernal was just a horrible Stalinist. He was a tank to the end. And I was wondering the, when you were going to mention that. I, I thought I, it was going to be an airbrushed story. <laughs> no, God, no. It has to be said. Mm -hmm. um, so so even though um, I know Verso is reissuing the world, of flesh and the world of Flesh and the Spirit, which he wrote in 1929, the original accelerationist text, uh, which, right. I, which I got to introduce. Uh, but I, but it, it does not go unmentioned that he was a horrible Stalinist. I don't quite put it like that, but that's what he was. Um, the, the, the one thing I just want to um, push back on a little bit is, is the journalism question. I was a columnist for a news corporation uh, newspaper called The Australian for nine oh, yeah. years. My bio used to read, lapsed Marxist in the pay of Rupert Murdoch. Right? Like I used to, oh, you want to introduce me? This is what you should say, because that's, that's who I was for a, almost a decade. Um, so I was kind of inside the, the machine in that sense. Um, and I don't think my, my remarks were not meant to be critical of journalism, but merely to say as a form of discourse it has a limit, and academia also has a limit, and they need to be self-correcting in relation to each other. Yeah? Uh, so the limit of academia is its luxury goods now. Uh, you know, and there's, there's a sort of way, like in some way Adorno thought, the good thing about classical music is it's not quite a commodity. The you know, upper reaches of academia in America are not quite fully a commodity yet. There's a little wiggle room, so you can actually do some interesting stuff there, and I want to extract that. Uh, so yeah, but it's luxury goods. But I, but I think if there's a limit to journalism, it's, it's narrative templates are kind of pre-given, and it's really hard not to do that. I know this from writing a newspaper column. Like, it, it had to be, all right, this is the story, and there's two positions on the story. Are you taking A or B? Was the thing that I was constantly up against. And not in the column, I also wrote op-eds. So I was kind of like struggling with this, you know, kind of on a daily basis. So it's a constraint. And it's where I think the, if Zizek is, is uh, among other things, the limit to what like, academia can push into that space, it's also the limit to what journalism can absorb. Because he had a way of uh, framing things that looked like the conventional counterintuitive story. Like there's always a space for the counterintuitive column. Uh, in a newspaper. New York Times just felt like they had to get a climate change denialist uh, just a few weeks ago, because it's like, oh, we gotta do the other side. It's, no, you fucking don't. There's no other side on that one. Uh, so I, you, but you can see the journalistic logic at work. Um, so yeah, that's sort of it. I, I did not want to come off as uh, academia good journalism, bad, not at all. I was uh, one species of journalist. I actually respect reporters more than columnists, I gotta say, having seen what they do. Uh, but columnists also, I know what it's like. So I'm more to, to can these two, can there be a, a space where those things inter intersect? So the category I'm talking about is actually not quite public intellectuals, and you're right about that. Um, that's why I called it something else. But I'm sort of, how can that then engage with uh, and be useful for not just journalists, but designers or artists or you know, other forms of what uh, a non-specialized form of uh, cultural production might be? Uh, so those are the only things I wanted to... Uh, same response, but yeah, ecstatic representations are present. Thank you for that. It's just sort of, look, if I could achieve that, I would really think I'd done my job, you know? Uh, uh, even if it's here, it's other people I'm, I'm channeling who did it. Oh, and the other thing is, uh, at least two of my cast of characters are really not academics. Uh, it's where Hiroki Izumi is really interesting because he chose not to do that. And like, smart guy, because the Japanese government has decided to pretty much abolish the humanities. Uh, and there's this separate thing in Japan called criticism, and he does that. Uh, which has its own uh, form of economic sustainability. Uh, and the, there may be one or two others who are sort of in that, that liminal category. Uh, so yes, yeah, uh, by no means do I want to make academics the, the center of it. That's it, so uh, um, thoughts from the audience or questions or um, I see hands going up already. <laughs> Tom, are you, are you gonna be in yeah, charge? It's been a long time since of the stack. <laughs> Let's take some. Let's take some questions, and maybe with the questions, we can, on a small scale, get, um, get some way towards, as Steve says, getting the audience to the starting line. <laughs> you? Thank you. First to, to Mackenzie. Uh, 
um, I, wa I want to know what do you think about co community experiences that try not just to interpret, but change, or better say, maybe intervene in some way or, an, or another in the economic functioning of the world. And here I speak especially about Bitcoin, for example. What do you think about intellectual experiments like Bitcoin and things like that? And to Steve, um, I've, I've worked as a journalist for some years in Brazil. I'm, 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 I'm Brazilian. And before entering academia full time, and so somehow I've, I've witnessed both sides some way. And, and I see lots of problems, especially concerning power issues, struggling between academics and journalists, and especially, I mean, owners of media enterprises and all that stuff. How do you see power issues within the relations between journalists and, and academics that you've presented us? This relation, in, the, in this regard of this relation, thank you. So I guess twofold there, Mackenzie on intellectual experimentation and Steve on the power relationships between corporations and individual journalists. The uh, New School for Social Research is also the Parsons, the New School for Design, uh, which is sort of all about, you know, trying to make stuff. Uh, and I actually love that uh, relationship. Um, you know, I, I was a journalist in Australia, I should say, but like in the United States, I had no cultural capital. Like I'm from the provinces, so I didn't get to do journalism there. But I do get to have a relationship with designers now. Uh, more interesting than Bitcoin is blockchain. Uh, and I thought Ethereum was a really interesting attempt to sort of think qualitatively what uh, a technology of trust might look like and what you could do with it. And there's like a third iteration of that uh, sort of going on now. And it's like just when you think like, ah, oh, there's no avant-garde anymore, or like, you know, you meet some people. And you, you know, like I, I chose like a Buddhist restaurant to meet these guys for lunch, which was just as well, because one showed up without shoes. I'm kind of like, that's hardcore. Like no shoes in California, yeah, that's easy, because you just get out of your car. No shoes in New York City, it's like, you know. Uh, so there's like a third generation blockchain that tries to decentralize it. Ethereum's still a little bit centralized. But a decentralized technology of trust, like that, I don't think anybody knows yet what the political, social, cultural, economic, consequences of that could be. And unfortunately, I am missing their frickin' summit in California because it starts tomorrow and I can't fly, but I'm like signed up for the next one to go figure that out. So yes, like it's kind of interesting to, the thing, as soon as you build it, you discover like, good thing about a concept is, you know, can be a lot of things, but when you build it, it's a thing that's actual uh, and you figure out what works and what doesn't. And they usually fail, right? Um, so, yeah, I'm very, very much interested in the next generation of the thing. And the thing about blockchain is it's very much about all the things the internet does incredibly badly. Uh, what do you do about the things that it's super terrible at, of which trust is central? So, yeah, super interested in that. Yeah, um, first of all, let me say, um, I've actually had good experiences with Brazilian journalists. So, uh, you know, I don't have... Yeah. Okay, no, and, and all kinds of very controversial matters, too, that they've asked me about. That, um, but I, I take your point in terms of the spirit of the question. Uh, the way I see journalism and academia, it, it, they're, they, the dynamics of power are kind of different the way they operate. I mean, they're, they're, they're power dynamics that are, in a sense, constraining both journalists and academ academics. Perhaps in the case of journalists, it's much more explicit because of the, the potential power that the owner can exert. Um, but the other thing I would say, though, about journalism, even under those circumstances, I mean, th there is another issue, and that is the aspiration for influence, okay? And I think journalists, you know, even when they are, you know, so journalists may be under pressure from owners and so forth, uh, and what makes that pressure matter is because there is a concern about the kind of influence that's actually emanating from the newspaper or the media outlet or whatever, uh, and so it kind of matters, in a sense, what's actually getting out there in print. Right. Whereas in academia, um, it seems to me that the power dynamics that operate on academics, which often are very constraining with regard to what we do, don't necessarily have this kind of aspiration of influence attached to it. It's more like an issue of freedom. Right. That is to say, academics kind of want to do what they want. Right. And, and, and that often and, and what that means in more polite company is, you know, we want to research whatever we want to research on and no one should stop us from doing that. But, but it's, you know, only some academics actually attach to that, the idea that they have a public mission on top of it, right? In which case then the constraints might start to matter in a way that look like the way they operate on the journalist. So, so 
I think there's a sense in which the thing that makes journalism kind of interesting to me as a public intellectual a vehicle is the fact that you know whoever's controlling it, however much constraint there is on it, however fr much freedom there may be in it, nevertheless there is a strong frontline direct intention at influence. Okay, whereas in academic culture it is not so obvious. It is not so obvious that even under the best of circumstances, where academics are allowed to write what they want and do what they want, that they would necessarily aspire to have public intellectual influence. Right? Again, this is be so, so there, there, there's a sense in which, um, yes, the, the, there are these different power dynamics going on between the two, but the thing that I would say is kind of interesting about journalism is it does have a frontline interest in trying to influence. And it seems to me that if you're going to be talking about public intellectual life, you have to have the desire to influence. And that will end up constraining a lot of the way you operate. So for example, the, the short newspaper columns and the short sentences and you know, in a way, knowing your audience well so that if you're making a, an argument, you make an argument that they can get, this kind of thing, which I don't think academic culture necessarily you know, has. Some, some people do, of course, some academics do. But I don't think it's necessarily part of what the academic culture does. Thank you. Can we take another question from the back this time? Anybody back there? No. <laughs> then here. <laughs> Richard, here you go. Oh, yeah. You got a ringer <laughs> in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's trouble. I, OK, OK. I'm, I, I'm just, I, sorry, I'm just going to be a train spot. It was actually 1931 that Burnell had the conference in London, because in 1937, Bukharin was starring in a show trial in Moscow. Okay, sorry, <laughs> my mistake. My sorry, mistake. I'm just to be a train spot. I, I want to come on, to, uh, there's two things, I think, one. Is, uh, I'm going to talk about the Marxist tradition, though I'm more like the fan club rather than the tradition. Um, so I thought it's interesting that you don't talk about people who read Capital, which is what he spent most of his life write, writing. Um, so for us, you know, I, I, I have to say I'm on the Labour left, so we used to say the cultural studies, it is the class enemy. Because you talked about people like Stuart Hall, Chantel Mouffe, they were the cheerleaders of Blair. You know, populism is get rid of class politics, and we are now fighting an election where we're shooting up in the opinion polls because we're fighting on a class programme. Yeah, so, and we have a shadow chancellor who says, I read, I've read Capital. Yeah, so I think that's interesting that you don't talk about that tradition, part of the tradition, which it seems to me that's the most important. We're going to do a critique of neoliberalism. I disagree with you. I think there's a lot in that book which you can take, and people have, you know, Andrew Kleiman and Alan Freeman and Michael Roberts. There's a huge tradition of people, I, I like, a, you know, I've got bookshelves of them, who have taken and advanced that part of it to understand what we're living in the moment, which I don't think, actually, though I've written, you know, I have claim to fame of writing about the information technology, Silicon Valley, you know, Californian ideology. It's actually what we're living under is financialization. And that, you know, that is volume three of Capital. A lot of that work comes out of that. And I, this is where I, you know, I can't, you know, I'm sympathetic to your thing of the vectorless class. I've taught a lot of them, yeah? And I wrote a class of the new book about people like that, about how we think there's always, you know, that people are making new things in new ways with new technology. But really, we're living under, you know, a bankocracy, you know? And that's very 19th century. In a way, my, when I was young, like some people here who were in their 20s, it was weird thinking life like that because we lived under Fordism, state capitalism. Actually, it became, in my lifetime, it's become more like capital, actually, more like the Grundrisse, where banks are in control, not the state, not the... So that's, I think... And the second... So I, I'm thinking that's one thing I found interesting about your list of people is they are not in there. And I think when you say people in the future, when they look back, they all think, how weird? Why aren't they in there? Because they are the people who are really the, the thinkers of our age. And they, they, they have a specialised skill. It is difficult to learn it. But I, you know, a friend of mine came to visit some people we're working with on some games for the Labour campaign, some browser games, and he said he was shocked at the early 20-somethings who haven't read Capital, because we'd all read it by the time we were 25. They're not educated. They're not, and there's something fundamentally difficult. You can't understand what people are telling you in television about the economy unless you've read this basic stuff. And you've left the whole list of those people are not talking about that. So well, it's like an absolute. Not entirely, not entirely the case. And no, like, so, okay, so the uh, okay. Can I, and then the yeah. second thing is how does that connect with the mass movement? And that seems to me the other interesting thing is that that knowledge has to be 
You, you, you had a tradition of the Bolshevik Party. You don't talk about... You're from an Australian Labour Party. It's a so, Marx didn't set up Bolshevik parties. He hated Bolsheviks, actually, if you read his writing. Yeah? What, he liked, what he wanted was a mass party, the Labour Party. What his relatives set up was the Labour Party, the French Socialist Party, the German Socialist Party, and people like the Australian... It's the ma and that's what we're fighting at the moment. I hope everyone here is going canvassing. <laughs> You know, that's the way you change the world is, you know, so, you know, Facebook, social media, all that thing is amazing. What we're doing now, it's nothing like it was in the 80s when I was first politicised. But you have to do this basic knocking on people's doors, talking to them in the streets. And that also is what we need to connect. It's not just journalism. It's also day to day organising. And I would, you know, as I said, I would urge everyone here to go canvassing. It's Karl Kautsky famously said, all intellectuals should go canvassing because then they find out what workers actually think as opposed to what intellectuals think they think. And go. You've got two weeks, half weeks, go canvassing for the Labour Party. Down to a couple of questions. <laughs> I just have one. Uh, Where is value theory? B, how does that connect with actually yes. changing the world by seizing state power? Yeah, I, I, you know, maybe I've been in the uh, United States too long where organised labour doesn't have a party expression. Uh, it's, it's a component of the Democratic Party, but it's not the party. Uh, so one, one can't really work in that space. So I've, I've been there too long. Uh, I've, uh, I've lost my, my labour roots and, I've, uh, and I would never tell anybody else how to do their politics in another country. Uh, um, on the first one, the first two chapters are for you. Uh, so, uh, Kojin Karatani, it's a sort of like rethinking of the whole mode of production thing. And, and he thinks it's something else. And it's a highly original, like rethinking of it if you take a sort of global perspective and decentralize it. Highly recommend it. Like, it's, it's, it was the hardest chapter to write because uh, I had to get it into 4,000 words and, and it needs more. Um, but the other one is Amy Wendling, like, it's the opening chapter. Um, she went and read Marx's technical notebooks, which have never been published. They're not even transcribed, because uh, David Rosanoff did not think they mattered. Uh, so there's a whole, like Marx is drawing diagrams of freaking steam engines to figure out how they work. So there's a whole thing about forces of production that tends to be a little neglected in the more economistic version of Marxism. So I've, I've gone like uh, ultra vulgar, in, in my own thinking, it's, it's, you've got to think the forces of production, and that requires technical knowledge, so you have to be able to talk to specialists, because that's what's driven something about the mode of production we're in, which, yes, one component of it is financialization, but what's the infrastructure that makes the financialization possible is the question I want to get to, because uh, I think you know, the information vector is the thing that makes all of that possible, uh, both in terms of a global infrastructure and the fact that we all have it in our pocket at the same time that those things are connected. So it was to kind of go more vulgar. Uh, that's why I haven't done the political economy piece that much, although the Caritani is on that. Uh, but there is more on the forces of production. Uh, and, and you know we don't disagree about uh, laborism. So all I need to say is, yes, that's what I would do if I had a labor party I could belong to in the, <laughs> the, the country to which I emigrated. I think we can move on. To, I, I agree with what Richard said. We can just move on to another question. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, there's one here and one there. <laughs> this gentleman over here. So, Mackenzie, many thanks. And Steve, many thanks for a very spirited uh, intervention as well. Your description of your book, uh, Mackenzie says, it's a guide to the thinkers and ideas that will shape the future. And I want to take a leaf out of Steve's uh, feedback and say, well, actually, you're missing you see, quite, a, quite, quite a lot. When you did say that there are, there's a big idea of the Anthropocene, which is basically mind changing nature more than ever before, and thinkers who don't take that into account uh, risk uh, being uh, overtaken by events. And I, I, I agree with you on that. But aren't there other things as well, which uh, will be the key ideas for the next 10 to 15 years? There is the technological unemployment, which is increasingly people realizing that more and more jobs will be transformed more fundamentally than we've seen before. This uh, has huge implications for what we used to call the working class, amongst others. Uh, then there's the kind of next wave, even after technological unemployment, which is robots killing our jobs. There's the uh, technological singularity itself, which is the emergence of uh, 
artificial intelligence, which uh, de pushes us into the, being the second most intelligent species on the planet after AIs. And then uh, there's the idea of transhumanism, which is the idea that uh, just as we are changing nature through the Anthropocene in question, we increasingly have the power to change human nature with the ability to change our prejudices, our biases, our spirituality, our intellect, our collaboration. Uh, so I'm asking, you know, where, where is the reference in your thinking to these ideas? People like people have written about that include public intellectuals, I would say like Yuval Noah Harari, the Israeli historian. We can look at the Britain's own uh, Paul Mason, uh, he's written a quite a feisty book, uh, Post-Capitalism, uh, Astonishing Range. There's a uh, Nick Bostrom in Oxford University written on superintelligence. There's even the person over there. So, <laughs> uh, I'm a modest guy, yeah. <laughs> Did you look at these threats? Uh, did, did you, do you think these have the potential to upend the discussions which, uh, uh, which uh, currently you've been looking at? Yeah, I, I thought about doing the Mason book, sorry. People at the back, can you hear the microphone? Oh. So people at the back, the question is whether the threats of transhumanism, technologization, especially in the form of AI, and the third part was so? Technological unemployment. And technological unemployment uh, are situated in discussion, how they tie in their theories to these three ideas. Yeah, I thought about doing the Mason. Uh, one of the books it cites is my Hacker Manifesto from 2004. Uh, and like, I, I know this is an immodest thing to say. I think I did it better in 2004. Because uh, it's like, you got to think past the labor theory of value. Like, we're sort of back in that in the middle of the book. Um, thought about that one. Um, quite a bit on technology and actually the Anthropocene and uh, technology are the two sort of critical angles that I wanted to look at you know the that's the filter that everyone gets passed through uh, throughout the whole book um, I'm a little skeptical about singularity but it's it's probably the case that if you think uh, if you stop thinking of the human as the the model of what cognition is uh, and think machine cognition is something that's not supposed to be like us, but supposed to be something different, it sort of already exists and it runs the planet. Uh, so how, how does one think that? And that's sort of actually one of the guiding threads of it. Um, but I wouldn't call it singularity. Um, I don't really do the transhuman thing because to me it gets a bit weird. Uh, but one of the reasons I really wanted um, Verso to do this reissue of uh, Bernal's The World of Flesh and the Spirit, because it's one of like the original foundational texts of that, uh, and, and kind of super interesting, and uh, that's a book that is like so of its time, it's 1929, but it's still also about the present, that's the thing about uh, some of the social relations of science people, they have these like weird insights into things that that really weren't going to happen for decades and decades, partly because they knew the current science, which nobody else knew. Uh, so, yeah, my bit on that is, is in the introduction to um, the reissue of Bernal and a book I might write on, on that world. Um, like the whole thing about um, uh, the technologization of human reproduction that we mostly get from uh, Aldous Huxley. Like Huxley got that from J.B.S. Haldane. Uh, so Haldane is another figure that I want to write about with, with Bernal. Uh, and one should mention also here Charlotte Haldane, who wrote a book about this before uh, Huxley did, because they were all, all pals at the time. So yeah, I got some things on, on that. That thing I want to say is, um, the, the please don't hold me to ransom for the cover copy, which I know I approved but didn't write. Uh, and if I get to rewrite it, it's going to be uh, uh, ecstatic representations of the present. <laughs> and, and the thing is, like, if you don't like this 21 people, like, make your own list. Uh, and I actually think we should do that as like um, general intellect's bingo on the Verso website or something. It's like, like you know, it's like it's you know, it could be any twenty-one. Like the thing I want to get away from is that thing of where like Sart is the person with all the answers. It's like no, you could pick any range of people and arrange them in a way that they relate to each other, and you'll grab a chunk of the world. So it could be this twenty-one, or it could be another. Uh, I just don't want to, you know, bet too heavily on like one vision of what's going to happen next. Because uh, the thing about the Anthropocene is no one knows what is going to happen, uh, except we know how much carbon there's going to be in the atmosphere and what it'll do to temperatures, what the consequences of that are socially, technically, politically. No one knows. Like, who are we kidding? And Steve, yeah. what do you have to say? Yeah, um, first of all, I mean, you, you, you may know this, uh, that, um, that the Haldane book, 
and the uh, Burnell book were part of the same series originally, right? Yes, yeah, Something of Tomorrow. Today and Tomorrow. Today and Tomorrow. Yeah, Thank what you, Keegan yeah. Paul published in yeah. the 1920s, a whole series of these kinds of books. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, one of the things I think David is pointing to, and, and in a way it's not just your fault, it, it, there is a sense in which the whole, what should we call it, um, kind of the, the, the left cultural studies, media studies crowd is still not really taking transhumanism seriously and, what, and, when, it, and when transhumanism, see within, tra, what, what gets talked about instead, and I think you may use the term once or twice in the book, post-humanism, right? So th there's that discussion about post-humanism which um, in a way is about the displacement of the human as the center of value and all the rest of it, and, and, and that's often done in connection with discussion of the Anthropocene and, and somebody like Isabel Stengers and Haraway, you know, people like that would be part of that discussion. But I think the thing in a way that's very um, touchy perhaps for people in your circles about transhumanism is that transhumanism, unlike this kind of sense of post-humanism I just described, uh, is actually wanting to ramp up what has made the human distinctive more than ever, right? So in other words, uh, you know, so in other words, it's not that we need, um, you know, less technology or, or somehow become more compatible with other things in the world, but rather we need to amplify, right? And that's really where the future lies, right? Uh, and so the talk of the singularity and all of this is very much in that direction. And it's a very gung-ho pro-science and technology, kind of like enlightenment on steroids, kind of approach to things. Um, and I think for people coming from your side, neck of the woods, that's a hard thing to kind of really come to terms with as a serious possibility. Because I guess you guys already start off with a sufficiently diminished conception of science and technology. So I'm very struck, for example, in your chapter on Stengers, right? You, one of the things you say about Isabel Stengers is, you know, she's not against the practices of science, she's against the institutionalization of science. Right, so what that means in effect is, you know, against this kind of overvalorization of science and technology, not the fact that scientists are working in labs trying to find out stuff. But of course, transhumanism is committed to this overvalorization of science and technology and saying that our future is going to lie with that, right? Uh, and in the way that it might actually radically transform our bodies where we become cyborgs or we end up living forever or we end up, you know, uploading our consciousness and all that kind of stuff. And you guys just don't really take that as a serious future, it seems to me. You really just will not even contemplate dealing with it. No, I'm, I'm a little closer to you on that than you would think. Okay, because the, the, the book doesn't suggest that. The, the chapters that maybe are is uh, Preciado and Azuma are kind of heading that way. Uh, okay. And the Azuma is really super interesting on emotional technology. Uh, and he doesn't have any problems with that. Like he yeah, kind of yeah, thinks, yeah, okay. you know, the whole otaku culture for him is all about... Uh, techn technologizing the emotions, and it's, he's fine with that. Uh, and I find that a really super interesting book. One more question, anybody? <laughs> oh, hi. Uh, yeah, it's a fascinating discussion. I, I'm more, more of a comment, maybe, maybe but I mean, it, it, it strikes as interesting. We're heading towards somewhere intriguing at the end here. Uh, I mean, Mackenzie talking about mining this sort of seam of technology and, and talking about theory and people and, and you know, you know interest heading down there you know, Steve's frustration that, that you know no one's having the conversation about the future but it, it strikes me that these two things are converging you know I mean from where I sit I see that the place that the conversation about the future happens is in the engineering departments mm -hmm. and the language it's happening in is in mathematics and and what is happening is that that debate is happening there the humanist departments don't hear it because they don't speak maths. But we're now living in a society where the actual nature of, of, of communication is controlled by the conversations that were being had in the engineering departments, which is why you're frustrated. The frustration comes that no one's having the conversation about the future because actually it's happening over there in the engineering right. departments and you can't have it in the yeah. humanities anymore because actually you're not speaking the right language and the language is mathematics. And so we're already living in this machine that's been built by the, few, the people having the conversation about the future. And the language that we're talking in this discourse, right, is feeling dated because it is dated, right? I remember when I was at Warwick, studying under, you know, with these guys and, and going to the first, first Futures in 1995, and I was at Warwick in 93. There was a guy, uh, 
Yorkshire guy on that course. I think his name was John. I don't remember his surname. Dan, Dan O'Hara will remind me. But, you know, we used to go to Nick Lands lectures and we used to sit there and he'd laugh at us all. He'd just say, guys, you don't speak maths. And you know what? He was right. You know, we didn't speak maths. And maths is where the language and the debates are happening and they're feeding back and they're limiting the way in which we can talk about the world because they're creating the environments in which we're having these conversations. It was so technologized now and I think that you know, that I think that your mining and talking to the Ethereum guys and, and, and exploring that is exactly the way we have to go. We have to acknowledge that the discourse is broader than the humanities are, have been able to accept. And they, we have to learn maths, right? And we have to understand that maths is not, you know, that it's a language, and it's, but it's not um, neutral and it needs to be understood as any other language and brought into the humanities departments because otherwise the humanities can get no purchase. That's my thinking. And I think it connects what yeah. you two are both saying because you're both saying really, really fascinating things and I think actually you're some way, there's a lot more overlap than sometimes the conversation is. But I think you're making two separate arguments and one I agree with are that yes, let's you know, uh, recognize the importance of the instrumentalizing of mathematics in the 20th century. Uh, the one I one agree with is making it sovereign. Uh, of like, oh, that's the only yeah, one that no, matters. That's my point. I'm not, yeah. I don't want to make so. I think that yeah. without the engagement from the humanities, yeah, it's it not really sovereign, it's just important. It convinces itself that mm -hmm. it's sovereign, and actually yeah. it's not, but leave yeah. it to the engineers. Mm -hmm. but, and you can't engage with it, and that you have to, you know, it needs to be engaged with on a, a deeper mm -hmm. level by the humanities, I think. Yeah, yeah but the thing is, I've, I've also experienced many of the futures engineers were so confident were going to happen that did not. Because history happens on a lot of timelines at once. And that's only one of them. And that goes through a kind of, you know, historical filter that has a lot of other uh, dimensions to it as well. So I'm like just a little wary of the hubris that kind of gets attached to that. Um, particularly at a moment when, you know, the, the language of uh, innovation and disruption uh, is now spoken as if it was a technical language when it really comes from Schumpeter, uh, you know. So it's like, you guys just borrowed a bunch of ideas from the 1930s, which might, might be good and powerful ideas, but they're not yours, they're ours. So, you know, to sort of put it more on the basis of not thinking there's any sovereign discourse or sovereign way of viewing the world, but really the conversation between them, I actually think that's a lot more contemporary than this, like, frankly, feudal idea that one discourse can rule the others. Let me, you know, one thing I would, I think it's always worth saying when we talk about bringing mathematics into discussion and learning about mathematics, I think one of the things that often seems very forbidding is that when one thinks about mathematics, one thinks about it as if it were this kind of, it's all about just you know, calculation and knowing how to solve equations and stuff. But in fact, what's very interesting about mathematics in its history is the fact that many different philosophical takes on mathematics, right? Mathematicians have approached their subject quite differently, and this has led them to say whether or not certain kinds of mathematical entities exist, you know, whether various kinds of geometries are possible, all the rest of it. This is part of the internal discourse of mathematics, which could very easily hook up with stuff that humanists are always talking about. And to a certain extent, I think, you know, if you look at about the, the, the people who are influential in the humanities who do have a mathematics background, Badiou is the one who comes to mind, um, there's a sense in which uh, he is kind of, you know, he knows that stuff and he's, he's done a kind of pick and choose job of what he wants to take from the full range of different philosophical perspectives on mathematics that he will then put forward to you in an authoritative way because you don't know any mathematics. And so, but, you know, whatever Badiou says mathematics is, that's the only option on the table. But in fact, if we had a, you know, a, a greater knowledge of the range of philosophical interpretations of mathematics that have been instrumental historically in the field, then we would be able to actually engage in a less forbidding way with somebody like him, who is actually quite interesting, but I think often is you know, approached in a take it or leave it fashion. Yeah. I think that's a really good point, actually. And I, and I think that's what I'm trying to get to, is that yeah, mathematics is not um, monolithic, uh, and, but it is often regarded as such by, by the humanity, and often uh, as a result, this, this engagement is not happening. And I think that this is exactly right. And that's part of what I'm you know, sort of floating here is that, that, that increased knowledge of breakdown and that, that nature and allow more insight. Because without that, we are socked to its effects. And it's controlling our discourses, which has been, has been seen in the last two elections. Right?
Oh, and, and I, I, I can't agree with both of you on this. And, and I also think that, yeah, what you might call meta mathematics is the way in. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yes. It is about ontological questions of uh, are, are numbers platonic entities? Right. Are there, is it a formal system? And it makes a difference what your answer is to those questions. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's even a sort of intuitionist, intuitionist school of yeah. Brewer, for example. You know, like, like that's a way that you can approach it. Uh, oh, yes. That's, that's a way one could approach it and join those things back together. So I think we're, we're agreed in joining those things yeah. back together as, as not only desirable in its own right, mathematics used to be one of the liberal arts, yes. um, but, but perhaps instrumentally useful as things that, you know, a generally educated person should know more about, given that it has been in instrumentalised, particular parts of mathematics, not all of mathematics obviously, but parts of it are instrumentalised and kind of run our lives. It would help to know a little bit about that uh, as well. And do you have any closing words for us, Mackenzie? Any message to the audience? My thanks to Steve for your, like, very generous. I, I really appreciate your, your generosity uh, uh, and to the uh, people in the audience. And my thanks to the library, to Tom, to uh, Dan, to Virtual Futures, and time for a drink. Yeah. Oh, and uh, there's, there's books at the back, and I'll sign them if you want. Yeah. So, <laughs> what a fascinating discussion. I think I took three or, four, three or four questions from that. Whether we engage with academics or let journalists engage with us. In short, who will we let influence us? What makes humans distinct and what machine we're living in? Whether mechanical cognition rules the planet or could be a tool in, capital, in, in the labor movement. And whether Mackenzie's book is an ecstatic representation of the present <laughs> or whether it represents the thinkers of the future. <laughs> um, I want to thank our team. A couple more thank yous. We seem to be layering each other at the moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we want to thank our team in particular, Sam and Miranda, for doing the filming. It's because of them that we are able to make the content available on YouTube and free under Creative Commons. A double thanks to the library and with special thanks to Anna for her hospitality. And also thanks to our co-directors, Dr. Dan O'Hara and Luke Robert Mason behind the decks over there for putting this whole thing together. We have a number of events coming up, so please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Virtual Futures to find out the latest or subscribe to our newsletter at virtualfutures.co.uk. And I want to remind attendees that if you love what we're doing at v VF, we're always on the hunt for sponsors or partners. Yay. And... As a final statement, sec, final, final. Um, the future is always virtual, and many things that seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for prediction. Though sometimes, on those much more rare, oca rare occasions, something remarkable comes from staring the future de deep in the eyes and challenging everything it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that tonight. Books at the back are at a big desk discount, Mackenzie's books, and people who bought them on Eventbrite can collect them there. Please join me one final time in thanking Professor Steve Fuller and Mackenzie Walk and yourself for being such a lovely audience. The bar is open.